Yes, Always now. Ready. Born ready. Always okay. Ready. Cool. Okay. So let's let's kick off like this. Good afternoon. Good evening or for Gordon, good morning. Very welcome, good. To, welcome to you guys, <laughs> not only to our speaker and my, my friend and my co-host Gordon, but also everybody that's joining the show live or maybe watching the recording. We really appreciate you guys every week tuning into the show. Uh, on behalf of my Gordon and myself, we'd like to welcome you. We look forward to today's show because we really have a great, great guest. Uh, and the funny part is when Gordon announced, he said, you know, I've got this guy. He's traveling the world with his family. You know, we should get him on the show. And I was, I was getting anxious. I was like, who's this guy? You know, I want to get to know him. He said, well, maybe you know him. I said, why? Well, he's also from the Netherlands, like yourself, Sander. I said, well, most likely it must be, is it the guy from the Bitcoin family? And Gordon said, it is. I said, Didi, he's my friend. You know, we worked together with, with, a, with a previous uh, project. And, and, you know, we got introduced to our mutual friend, Vincent, from, also from the, from the crypto industry. And since then, we've been in, in contact. So... I'm really happy to have a fellow Dutchman in the show today, Didi. But before we get started, for everybody that's here on the live show, so most of you know the concept, right? So the first part, Gordon and myself, we're going to talk with our guest, uh, Didi, today. We're going to you know, talk about the past, we're going to talk about the present, and we're going to, of course, talk about the future. And during the conversation, we're going to get some of our alumni speakers. So the speakers that were attending in one or more of the previous shows already. We're going to get them involved. We're going to get them on stage. And I already see that we have some um, alumni speakers already in the call. So welcome, guys. Good to see you back. We're going to get you into the conversation during this uh, stream. And in the meantime, for all the uh, audience that is um, watching the live stream, if you have any questions or you want to contribute something, put it in the chat box. So we keep all the microphones closed during the, uh, the Zoom call during the live recording, but you can post, of course, in the chat room. We will take care of the questions and put them there. Uh, so maybe before we get started, Gordon, for the people that don't know you yet, and most people do, but maybe you tell a little bit <laughs> about yourself, right? Uh, this is Gordon, and I am running on fumes, my friends. I got to say, this was like an all-nighter with Russia, an hour crashing back up, and then excited <laughs> to be here. But there's, there's no way I couldn't be here because Didi... It's just like made such an impression when I first met him and he was kind enough to join the show. It's like, you know, I'm here. I got my water. Maybe soon I'll have my coffee. Uh, it is 5.30 LA, 5.30 AM in the morning in Los Angeles. That is not my real background this time. I don't know if you can tell. I'm sure you yeah. can. Uh, normally I'm situated at my kitchen table and it's dark outside and it becomes light as the day gets going. Um, this time I decided I'd mix, it, I'd mix it up a little bit. But anyways, everyone, I'm, I'm Gordon Einstein. Uh, I'm an attorney who does just crypto and blockchain law. Uh, I'm happy to be doing this series with my friend Sonder, uh, Crypto Wednesdays. This is Crypto Wednesdays week 13 or week 14, depending on how you count. We've done some additional episodes during the various weeks. But we, this is purely to be a service to the crypto and blockchain community. Uh, to help build that community, to get ideas passing forth between the people, to get in different perspectives. And I'm just honored and thrilled to be doing this. This is a, a weekly thing that's kind of developed its own following and its own path, which, which is great. And so I think, I think we should just kind of like, you know, it's not the Gordon show. It's not the Saunders show. It's the guest <laughs> community show. So let's did you, man, I, I, I'm feeling you already, my brother. I'm feeling you from so many thousand <laughs> miles away. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Miles is what we say in America, by the way, because, you know, we, we do that and we do that and we do the Fahrenheit. Um, so, Sander, should we just launch? Yeah, I, I think we can dive into the, to the conversation. So, Didi, what we normally do when we have a new speaker on the show, and that's you today. Yeah. We're really grateful that you spent some time. First of all, tell us a little bit, because you travel the world with, with your family, but where, where are you today? Because we are in three different time zones, but where are you? Um, at the, for, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, man. It's an honor again to uh, now eat me, Gordon. Next time we will have a drink together, again together. I think that was also a very funny drink we had, I think, at <laughs> that time. Uh, Sander, yeah, we met many times. At the moment, I am at oh, uh, look, Hold on, we had pizza also. 
This is a Mallorca on the, on, the, on the on the pier. Come on, Mallorca don't leave out the pizza. You're making me sound drunk. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> the, 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 no, the food was amazing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, it was it? Yeah. Um, yes, as we, I am in Portugal at the moment. I was in Spain. Before Spain, I spent uh, about five months in uh, Thailand, in Koh Phangan. That was during the whole COVID situation. So I was on a very safe island where I'm building this new digital nomad co-working, co-living space, but it's a blockchain uh, space. And then we flew to Europe because the kids wanted it. We came into Holland for a week. I needed to leave immediately because I couldn't stand all the lines on the streets and the squares where you need to stand and the face mask. And so I left Holland to Spain. Uh, without um, investigating Spain and then I come into Spain and that's like almost a dictatorship over there now so <laughs> we, we, we made plans to, uh, to, to leave Spain and now I just arrived yesterday evening here in Lagos, Portugal. Cool. And how nice is it? Is it, the, is it amazing? It's, it's, Portugal is so beautiful. You know the most beautiful part of Portugal is that you we have a 0% tax rule for Bitcoiners, <laughs> so we don't pay tax <laughs> in Portugal, which is amazing. Um, the beaches are beautiful, the nature is beautiful, the people are nice, and it's, uh, it's dirty cheap to live here. So yeah, it's, uh, it's nice. I have an amazing view. I found a beautiful house with a... I don't know if I can show it because the light will... Uh, I'm sorry, is that a Run DMC t-shirt? No, there's one BTC. Run BTC? <laughs> awesome. That's my whole vision. <laughs> Okay. Um, so yeah, so it's it's beautiful to be in Portugal now. Yeah, love it. The kids. So are I, I, I just pulled it up on Google Maps. I, I guess Lagos, Portugal, is the south. It's the southern coast. Yeah, uh, Med- But it's it's actually it looks like it's outside that. Well, I guess all of Portugal is outside the Mediterranean. So it's on the. Atl- okay, I see near Faro or Faro. Oh, interesting. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, a, just, it's, it's, it's a strange country, Gordon. It's, um, it is very um, liberating, a liberated mm-hmm. country. So, and I like that. You know, I don't mm-hmm. like the, the, the dictatorships. I can't live there. That's why we travel the world as a digital nomad. We mm-hmm. live completely decentralized. We still don't own shit. Yeah, Bitcoins and all some other cryptos and some backpacks with clothes. And for the rest, we don't own anything. Mm-hmm. So we are searching for this place where you can have your, you know, your, 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 you can say what you want. You can do what you want. And Portugal seems to be in the nature of being very liberating to crypto, to the use of drugs, to everything. You know, it's a liberating country. So, uh, yeah, I think I feel at home here. Beautiful. And you, it's interesting that the masks comment. The, there's, I'm, I'm always, for, for personal reasons, I'm always keeping an eye on which countries can fly into Switzerland and which countries can't. Yeah. And that list pixelates every two weeks. And I think Portugal is on the allowed list. But I, I'm going to throw this out of here. I always get a little bit nervous with a, a country that doesn't have the masks because I wonder if they're going to run into problems kind of okay. soon, especially, especially if they're letting in tourists. That happened to me with Croatia. You know, Croatia had the open borders, wasn't having any kind of COVID. All, all the tourists, especially from America, went there in part so they could spend yeah. 14 days there and then go into the rest of Europe. And now yeah. Croatia's back on the, blo- on the block list. So yeah. Um, yeah, any I comments? Think it's, yeah. It's, uh, what do you want me to say? You know, I, 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 I just want you to say whatever comes to mind. <laughs> okay. I, 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 don't, I don't have an agenda. <laughs> so first of all, I, I don't believe the whole COVID um, hoax. Um, yes. I believe it's a, a I believe it's um, a flu. And it's a flu like we see very often, and it, this one is a very tough flu. But if we compare this flu to the other flus we had a few years ago and to the Mexican flu and everything, I think it's still, you know, let's say like this. I want to wait till the moment that this flu has passed a year. So that will be in October, November this year. And I want to see the total amount of dead people all over the world in every country, if that one is really shifted tremendously grown exponentially because of the COVID. Because I don't think we will see those numbers. I think we will see that yes, more people died of COVID, but less people died of the normal flu. And on average, the same amount of people have died this year that died last year and the year before. Uh, Belgium already came out with the numbers. Belgium had less people. Belgium is the worst case case, COVID case in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And they even now showed numbers that they had less people dying than two years ago with the normal flu. 
So, you know, let's see what it is. I think it's, it's very bad that a lot of people died of it. And I, I feel very sorry for all those people. But I do think that the response we had as governments and as people, sheeple almost, uh, was terrible, wrong. And it was like overreacting because there is an agenda behind it. If it's a crisis agenda or economical agenda, I don't know. But you cannot tell me that the flu is this smart and in some countries you don't need to wear a mask and there you do need a mask. Here in Portugal, we were able to drive the border from Spain to Portugal without any controls. In Spain, I need to wear a mask on the streets. In Portugal, I yesterday went to the boulevard, you can walk around without mask, you can mm -hmm. do everything you want. So I think there is so much, but you know, I, 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 just, I, I just feel sorry for all those people that have died, but Gordon, I'm a type of guy that has, has felt sorry for everybody that has died. And, and we still need to wake up that we can see that over 500,000 children are dying almost like, like daily, you know, of, of diarrhea or of hunger. Mm -hmm. you know? So, and now this whole situation with Bitcoin and crypto and, and all that printing of the, the U.S. government makes me wonder now and then if it is so easy to print money to save an economy. Why don't we? Print yeah, why don't we print for that? Yeah. Why don't we print a shitload of money to save those people from hunger? Tell me, you know. So yeah, yeah. there are so many questions related, I think, to the COVID situation that that I took the standpoint. I live a digital life. I am completely free to go where I want. So I choose the country where I don't have to taste the fear of the people on the street. You know, that look at you in a strange way. Oh, you're a tourist. You don't have a face mask. Oh, you're going to affect me. Yeah. I don't want to live in these countries anymore. That's uh, not. Yeah, in the U.S., we have that for political reasons. <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little freaky. I, uh, you know, you know, this is. Sandra, can I can I may I go ahead a little bit? Yeah, yeah go, okay. go ahead. You know, this, is, this actually segues a lot into why DD why you crossed my mind about coming on the show, and you know, of course, then I found out about your and Sandra connection. It felt like his name and fate. Um, do, do you mind? This is personal, but I, this is kind of a personal thing you and I shared, which is why you made an initial imp impression on me. The, we, you and I met in Mallorca back when, at least I, I could travel the world. You apparently never stopped. And it came up that, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll describe it generally, and then I'm going to let you provide the details, that you had a situation with your parents that resonated with me as someone who went through something similar with my dad. Yep. And, you know, that was like, that was far more emotional and personal than I expected to get at a Bitcoin conference, but it, it really hit me. So can you talk about what you were doing? We'll, we'll talk about everything you're doing now, but can you talk about what you're doing before and then what happened with your parents to kind of like rework your internal mechanics? Yeah, I can, I can give you the, the, I will tell you the, the, the medium version story because else the show will take too long. But, you know, yeah. when I was 24 years old, my mother was 48 years old and I was uh, living this normal life. I studied uh, higher economics. I played some professional football before. And then I went to school, higher economics. And when I was 24 years old, I went to visit my mother and father on a Wednesday evening. And after dinner, I told my mom, hey mom, um, see you tomorrow, love you, bye. She said, bye. And in the evening, my brother called me and he was like, Didi, please come back, please come back. Mother is not breathing anymore. So, you know, I drove there and I find my mother there being uh, rehabilitated by an ambulance uh, uh, people. And um, she goes into coma. She's 48 years old. She goes into coma. Seven days later, she dies. So at that point, I'm 24 years old. I cannot cope with those feelings. So I become a workaholic, a very materialistic workaholic that just wants to make money and wants to be a millionaire to do whatever he wants in life. Because I thought at that point that this accumulating of wealth was the end goal of life, because that would give you this happiness you're searching for at least that was taught me on schools. And then I, I did it, you know, at 12, 13 years old, a uh, year long, um, I worked, worked, worked. I built my first company, second company, third company. I even took a management job of an online casino in Malta. So in 2014, I was on top of the world, you know, I had a big house, I had, I had two cars, I had my motorbike, the kids had their own quads, I had a holiday house. Um, everything. I had a company with 20 employees, 1,700 square, mil, square meter building and everything. And, and I had a big ego. <laughs> let's, mm -hmm. say, let's, let's say it like this. I was a very naturalistic uh, person. And 
I started mining bitcoins in 2013 because a guy told me, hey, well, you can become a millionaire out of this. So I bought mining equipment and, you know, b built the, those rigs myself and started to mine bitcoins and uh, dogecoins. And then in December 2014, I was driving my Jeep Cherokee. Um, I was driving home and my father calls me and he's like, Didi, are you sitting? And I said, yeah, I'm sitting there. What's up? And he's like, I just came from the hospital. Uh, I'm diagnosed with cancer. I have one more year to live. And that's a 4% chance I, I live longer, but it's almost in the hill. So I find myself again driving home to my father's house. You know, you run into your father, you hug, you cry. Um, and you quickly realize that you, you just have one more year. year. So that's December 2014. So I, I immediately decided to hire managers for my companies in 2015. I moved back to my father's home in his basement. It's what we call a souterrain. It's like a base level of the house. Mm -hmm. But living there with my family, because I just wanted to be around my father every single minute of the day. And, you know, watch the last football match, watch, celebrate last Easter, do all the stuff, you know, you, you, would, or you, would, um, you would even regret if you don't do, the, 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 do them at that time. Mm -hmm. So that is what we did. And then exactly a year later, um, we had Christmas together that, that went fine. And then January, um, my father died when I was next to him and in his house. And th then you get in this, this roller coaster ride that you need to organize the funeral and uh, the inheritance. And my father was a professional football player. So I organized a funeral in a football stadium and, and then, on top of that, I also did, a, did this. Uh, so I, I got to say, he, he must have loved that, actually, from wherever he was he, looking from. I, I think he enjoyed it really much because it was just was beautiful. Though. There were like 4,000 people in the stadium, and he was there um, with his coffin on the field, and uh, I gave a speech and everything. And then and after that, we did a match between all professional team players and the old uh, Maluku All-Stars because his roots are from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And then that was like two months later, I, then I was struck with a huge burnout. You know, I, I, I just burned out completely, completely. I couldn't um, get off the couch anymore. You know, brushing my teeth, uh, tooth was, was like too much. And that's when I told to my wife, like, this cannot continue like this. You know, I, I, I have a family to take care of and I, I'm, I'm finding myself wanting to jump in front of a train or whatever. We need to change. And uh, so, so I told her, let's go to Thailand and take three months off, just mental, physically reset on a beautiful island where I don't have to think about anything else. So that's what I did. I booked uh, tickets to Thailand. We went there for three months and those three months became seven months because in those three months, we as a family, we, we, we just found out that this life, owning nothing, no luxury stuff, mm. just a few backpacks and your kids around you was making us more happy than, than all those 10, 12, 13 years of my, you know, luxury, egoistic life. I, I was building sandcastles with my kids and that made me happy, you know, that, that I was disconnected from my, from my family and I was reconnected by these three months. So we, we just talked with each other and we said, okay, let's extend this. Let's try this some longer. So those three months became seven months. But in those seven months, Gordon, this friend called me and he's like, Didi, do you still own your Bitcoins and your Dogecoins? I'm like, yeah, somewhere, but I'm, I'm in Bali on the beach, drinking a Bacardi Coke, watching a sunset. I'm not going to touch my laptop. And he's like, do touch your laptop. He's like, touch your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I'm not going to. But in the evening, I, I checked my laptop. The coins were not there. I called my sister. I had another laptop at home. She was living in my house at that time. I told her, can you open the laptop? Open this wallet, the Dogecoin wallet, that one that they were a few million Dogecoins over there. Mm -hmm. And I could see the value increasing. And then I said, okay, so I said, can you open the Bitcoin wallet? And she was like, yes, and, and it worked. I said, now please shut down the laptop, put it somewhere very safe on a cupboard or somewhere. Nobody can touch it till I'm home in Holland. So she did it, but I could see the value and the value increased so much that I could pay the whole trip of seven months and, and still have money left, you know? So I, I, I figured out, okay, let's, let's go online. Let's go to all these, um, uh, to all the forums and everything and to check if, if people are speaking about it and you could see you know could see the community growing and everybody becoming active again and and, and i'm sorry did he, when exactly was this, this give me, give this me the was, give me the date give me the year and the month and all that stuff uh the, this was uh, the end of let's say the beginning of 2017 that we uh, were in bali yeah 
Okay, and you mined the coins back in 2013? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the, as I, if I still remember, it was around $800, $900 in Bali at that point. And um, it started growing. It went to 10. So in 2014, of course, I had the first crash from 1200 to 200 when I sold some Bitcoins to break yeah. even crash. and to, to, to get out my investment. Yeah, that was the crash at that point. And that was also the point that I lost trust. All I need is one more so crash I, like that, and then I'm I'm set for life. <laughs> you know, I, I I got some dry powder. Yeah, yeah. And now I understand the pattern as well. Yeah. But then in Bali, you know, I, I I did check this, and then and I and I went to my wife and I said, "These bitcoins, it's growing again." And then the day after this, mm. I'm on the beach, Nusa Lembongam, a small island across Bali, and I meet this guy from South Africa. And this guy is sitting there and I, he looked like dreadlocks, a cool guy to have a drink with. So I joined him for a drink. And mm -hmm. then he told me his story that he was a, a trader uh, on, the, on, the, on the normal stock market, but he left his job to, to full-time trade Bitcoin. He went all into Bitcoin. And I'm like, so you also think that it's going to succeed? He said, this is going to change the monetary system. That's why I left the traditional system. And that was the moment I caught fire again. That was the moment I started to believe again in this revolution. We are going to change this monetary system. We're going to disrupt this whole monetary system and create a new monetary system that is accessible for everybody out there. And yes, I want to support it. So I went to my wife and I told my wife, okay, we are completely happy. We talk many times with each other. We agreed that we want to lead by example to our kids. We want to show them that life is not about accumulating wealth, but about accumulating happiness. So let's do this. Let's go home. Let's sell everything we have. Let's go all into Bitcoin and keep traveling the world as digital nomads and show our kids that all that stuff that we sold didn't make us happy, but the traveling, the meeting the people, to be educated by, by living life, that that one would make, us, make you happy and the kids happy in the future. So she looked at me at first and, and, and of course her reaction was, uh, uh, you know, I believe the happiness part. <laughs> I love the travel. Like, honey, can we be a little bit? Like, can we be a little bit selective with the revolution? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah well, I like I, I like the pretty dresses. <laughs> yeah. Do we have and to the burn 70, down the? Yeah, I got it. Okay. And the seventy <clears> pairs <throat> of shoes and all that stuff. <clears throat> but you know, she was very minimalistic already. I was a materialistic, egoistic bastard, and she was a Zen person that always said, ah, "Do you really need that?" Did he say, "Yeah." Do you really need the car? I say, "Yeah." Do you? And, uh, and she was always ah. So that part she loved. The Bitcoin part, of course, that was a risk. Um, but she was like, I want to teach my kids the right way to live. So let's do it. But I don't see you selling your Jeep Cherokee and all that stuff. So I went online. I sold my che Jeep Cherokee in, in January and the, the audio cabriolet and my motorcycle, bought Bitcoins directly. And that's when she said, okay, Let's do it. Let's let's go with your crazy thoughts because mostly your crazy uh, now, thoughts. Now, hold on. I, this is where to me, <clears throat> you're like an original gangster. It's it's not just that you lucked out. I mean, I'm doing lucked out in quotes. It's not it's not just that you had enough prescient thoughts to mine Bitcoin in 2013, and then I'm I'm using air quotes lucked out by yeah. rediscovering them in 2017. Yeah. Is that even when Bitcoin was at some massive high in 2017? You sold all your stuff and doubled down and reinvested in Bitcoin even more. Like you, it's not just the Bitcoin you mined; you bought Bitcoin. Even you sold your stuff and bought yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We bought it. We we started to buy around twelve hundred to fourteen hundred dollars. That was the bike and the cars, and then we just looked at each other and we were like, "And now we're flying home, and I'm going to sell my house of Bitcoin." And she's like, "Selling your house of Bitcoin? Nobody is going to accept this. I'm going to try it because it's a cool marketing stunt." And maybe people will see the house earlier, you know? So we went flew home. A friend of mine was a real estate agent. I told him, I want to sell my house for Bitcoin. And he's like, Didi, what is Bitcoin, you know? So I just put it on the website for, so, for sale for Bitcoin. So he did. And then the local news found out. And they made a, it's a small local t television item. And then the national news found out. And then it went mm -hmm. yeah, viral worldwide because the house was sold in two weeks' times, partly for Bitcoins, partly for money. And, and then we went all in. So then you are there, we, we were homeless, but we, we had a bag with Bitcoins uh, and a bag with money that, that we exchanged into Bitcoins as well. And, and then you, you start to, to realize, oh shit, we just went all in. And then you start to dis, you discover that you still have a Then pension you realized. Fund. And then, then you realize. She, she must have loved that. You know, <laughs> Hopefully you didn't share too much shock. All right, yeah. But the, the shock came after. The shock came when I told her, but darling, we just, 
I also found uh, some savings, some kids' savings. So what do we do with this? And uh, she was like, oh, we are not going to touch the kids' savings. And I'm like, but I can triple them in a week or two weeks. And she's like, no, nah, we don't touch the kids' savings. And so we did at the end. <laughs> and we tripled you, the savings. You have a really strong marriage. We, we did. And, and I, I even took my pension fund. And with a 40% loss, because you, if you take your pension fund early, you lose 40%. Oh, oh. And, uh, Remember, I'm a lawyer, I and I deal well. this stuff. You, you liquidated your retirement fund early, took the penalty, and so you could invest it in Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, I even, I even sent this guy a letter, an, an email, like, why the fuck don't you know, what, and why are you not investing in Bitcoin? I can see that you are investing my pension fund and many... Uh, stocks, but you have been losing 8% a year. You're not winning 8% like you promised me. You're losing. We are break even at the moment. And, and you know, that was around 2016, 17. Uh, so I'm like, you're not making money for me. So I, I'm, I want the money out. I'm going to triple it with Bitcoin. And he was like, you're crazy. Bitcoin, blah, blah. So I will, so show, I will share the result after a few months. So I could already share the result after four weeks because that Bitcoin, exactly before I went, the pension fund went in at 6K Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So, and then Bitcoin took off and it went to, uh, yeah, to 20K. So I, I quickly emailed the guy, you need to top up your knowledge in the financial market because it's going to qu change quickly. And he was like, this is multi-level marketing, Didi. We will never touch this. It's okay, <laughs> whatever. Well, I, actually, you know, this is a, but by the way, the way this stuff works is I, I really interrupt the guest anytime I feel like it and just kind of throw curveballs. So that's, and Sandra loves me. So thank God for that. So, you know, th this, this segues into a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is pr probably at the time you were doing this, your investment advisor couldn't invest in big, big Bitcoin because it wasn't regarded as a, yeah. an, a, an appropriate asset for a regulated retirement account. Like, you, you know, maybe, you know, you could do so the Coinbase of the world, but, you know, at least in the U.S., you know, if, if you're trying to... You, at the time, if you were doing an IRA, an individual retirement account, or a pension plan, or whatever, it, you you had to you couldn't invest in Coca Cola bottles. You had to invest in certain yeah. allowed things. So it was not regulated on anything at that point. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think I'm I'm sure in Europe the default is unless it's allowed, it's denied when it comes to to yeah. investment assets. Like it's 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 not like there's a list of things you can't invest in. I'm sure in Europe there's a list of things you can invest in if you're managing a pension. So kind of kind of the complaint you're making to this guy, I, th I think you're kind of teasing him a little bit. Was you know, in real life he couldn't have done it even if he was all in on Bitcoin with, of with your I, with your retirement account. But and, you, you, you know maybe I, I now a, the law is different in Europe a bit, or at least you can invest in funds that invest in Bitcoin. So it's a, you, you're, you're kind of pointing out that the re, the regulatory structure also needed to catch up. So yeah, but that was, go, go that was exactly what, you know, I, I was in this revolutionary euphoric mindset, you know, I could see Bitcoin going up. So I was like completely euphoric and telling this guy, you know, you need to update your knowledge. This is going to change the monetary system. And you are an advisor when it comes to money, to mm -hmm. investments. So if you don't update your knowledge, and, and of course it could be that, that the regulatory, regulatory um, groundwork was not there, but he can update his knowledge on this what is going to change the future and he didn't even know what bitcoin was you know so that was the whole discussion but uh, we had a, a laugh after it many times and he and he bought bitcoins uh, oh, but he go. bought bitcoins uh, he bought bitcoins in the bull run so <laughs> yeah don't tell me he bought them at twenty thousand dollars because you know then the story's I think not... at 16 or 15 or 16 he stepped into bitcoin so he's only down okay. five okay <laughs> yeah yeah he's not down that much yeah <laughs> Okay. So yeah, that was the story. And, and then, you know, you, you, you will get into the international media because of Business Insider and that article. Yeah, and since this, Gordon, we were born to the Bitcoin family and, and some documentaries are made about us and we just kept traveling and doing this and supporting crypto 24 seven and, and still are till the day of today. We, we don't have any other jobs. I trade crypto, um, I, I breathe crypto, I, I do my, my presentations, I have a book written in, about crypto. Um, we just do everything to support people and to support the whole uh, crypto industry because we we believe it's going to change the world for the better. So this is the, the most important thing of everything we do. Even the YouTube channel we have now, you know, I, 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 I'm completely transparent what we, we earn and the thing we earn, we are going to share this with poor people and charities or invest it in startup projects that are going to help poor people. Because we still think that the true fundamentals behind Bitcoin and blockchain is there to 
give everybody the equal chances in life by giving them equal access to the monetary system. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe it won't be Bitcoin. Maybe Bitcoin will be the goal, but then it will be another cryptocurrency or it will be Litecoin or it will be Bitcoin Cash or it will be whatever, you know, but it's changing the whole monetary system for the better. And this is exactly what I want to show people, you know, understand that you can now transfer money all over the world just with a mobile phone. 3 billion people, unbanked people, or 2.7 billion unbanked people are now able to interact with this whole new monetary system. And um, the sooner the better, in my opinion, so that we can completely decentralize this world and disrupt not only the monetary system, but also the whole political, political system, Gordon, because I do think we have a lot of failure there as well. Um, and and it's, for me, it's a revolution. And I'm still very enthusiastic about the revolution. I will probably get some loopings in this roller coaster li- ride in the next couple of months. But, you know, mm-hmm. for me, it's just, it's, it's life. So there's about three different directions I want to take this conversation. And <laughs> I, I'm feeling very ADHD about it. But let me, let me, you, you, as I was writing the invitation copy for this show, it, here's what struck me. Yeah. It's, the, we're almost at 2021. And it's we're not we're not in that world where where you're having i don't think we're in that world where you're having that conversation where you're having to you know where the word bitcoin is new to people you're you know even your investment advisor knows what bitcoin is everyone knows what it is even if they don't understand what it is in full and the consequences of it but the, the word is new and or not no longer new the so going into 2021 is the job to let people know about Bitcoin or is there something, is there like step two that's appropriate well, now? It, I, think, I think we are wrong. In, I think we, we need, you need to see it like this. You know, we, we have Bitcoin. And yes, we can say that a lot of people know what Bitcoin is, but that's what we think. But if you really investigate what the same thing all over the world, then you just discover that it is not true. Okay. You know, you, you affected your surroundings with the words of Bitcoin and they will know, but there are many people living in, in, in places that never heard about Bitcoin, but we have never focused as a community on reaching those people. And what I mean with this is that we have been targeting the wrong audience, no, not the wrong, the right audience for this first part of the growth of Bitcoin, the financial people, the revolutionary people. Mm. But now, if you want to make this mass adoption you need to start to target the netflix people you know the people that don't think about finance that don't youtube after and look up for bitcoin no there are people that um, look completely different things on television and on netflix so i want to create entertainment connected Mm -hmm. to bitcoin and that is why i combine a life as a family with traveling the use of bitcoin so that we create a different sort of um, content that not mm. anybody, everybody else is doing because everybody is doing the YouTube show and uh, analyzing the market, analyzing the price. Yes, but who is going to watch this? Only the people that are interested in Bitcoin. We need new people that did, didn't hear or are not interested in Bitcoin, but we want them to see it as fun, not as a scam, not as an illegal multi-level marketing thing that the media told them in 2017. But now we want to create cool entertainment that shows those people, wow, This guy with a family still living on Bitcoin four years after he went all in. He's paying Mm. his Bitcoin. He doesn't own bank accounts. He can still live on this. This is possible. And if you create... And in the Netherlands, you're technically homeless, right? You don't have an address. (laughs) Yeah, I am homeless. We are still homeless. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's uh, That's awesome. uh, That that Um, was a loophole. (laughs) You know, take take that loophole. So, interesting. Okay. So you're, you're, I guess you're, 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 I kind of reframe it, but you're, you're challenging the premise of my question, which, and you may be right, which is, yeah, in our immediate circles, sure, people know what it is and they may even yeah. understand it a little bit, but it hasn't been widely adopted yet. And I, and it's, I'm hearing you saying that the method for reaching people outside of this immediate circle is more an entertainment oriented, not the method, but the medium, you know, the medium is, is the message. You know, you're, you're doing the entertainment type medium. And, you know, by the way, I, I love your YouTube channel. I, I looked at it and, and prepped for this. And I was just kind of clicking through there. And I, I like when your family went to Lieberland. Yeah. You know, that, was, that was a neat episode. I was like. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, Leave a Lab was really cool. Um, uh, Bitcoin City was awesome because we know we can live completely off Bitcoin in that town, in that city. So that's, we've seen so many beautiful places. And that is, that is why I keep pushing Coin. Because mm -hmm. yes, everybody has known about Bitcoin, but why is it not accepted everywhere? I went into Rovereto, Italy, which they, which they call Bitcoin Valley. Mm -hmm. This is a small town, Rovereto, a small town in Italy that a traditional town, you know, a tr traditional Italian town mm -hmm. where 60 stores accept di direct payments of Bitcoin. I can pay my butcher, I can pay my groceries, I can pay my clothes, toys, car, driving license, taxes, completely everything in this traditional town. So I went in, in this butcher store where there's ladies working of 60 plus and, and, and I'm like, you see these traditional hams and, 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 and you know, the marmalade pots and everything. And I'm like, are you- You're getting me hungry, accept, but yeah. <laughs> are you accepting Bitcoin? And she said, yes. I said, except, do, do you know how to accept Bitcoin? She pulls out the iPad, QR code. And she's 16 plus. So mm. I see this in this small town in Rovereto. I said, if this town can do it, every town in the world can do it. So I, I visit this company that, that facilita facilitates this whole Rovereto situation. And I find there's just one company that was the motor behind the whole adoption in this town. One company of two person that took the time to visit all the storeholders and tell them and educate them how to accept Bitcoins and what was the, um, you know, what were the advantages of accepting Bitcoin. And, he, and they completely changed this town into a Bitcoin city. Then I arrived in Slovenia, in the biggest uh, city of Slovenia, Ljubljana. Mm -hmm. They have a, a shopping mall called Bitcoin City, BTC City. There, I could pay 100% of my daily needs directly with Bitcoin, over a thousand shops, cinemas, food, everything. So then I see it also in a capital of a country, it can mm -hmm. succeed. I can see it in a small village, it can succeed. So then all other villages in the world can succeed as well. You just need one motor per village that educates the people in the use of it. Yes, you know, Gordon, I have heard about uh, Let's see drag flying many times. That doesn't mean I can walk up a hill and drag fly. Somebody needs to tell me how to do it. Show me how to do it. Millions of people can heard, have heard of Bitcoin. Mm. That doesn't mean they know how to use it. That's very true. We need to educate them. And then we get to the second step that we think that I think that we are doing completely wrong in this industry. Mm. We are also doing many things right. But what we are also doing wrong is that we could have learned from the past. We could have seen how the banks got you, me, Sander, and all the audience into their system. Very simple. When you got 12 years old, they sent your father a letter. Your son is old enough to have a bank account. You, he gets this uh, piggy bank. He gets 25 euros, and he gets mm -hmm. a plastic card, and he can live independent now. And you feel cool because you can buy your first Sport Live in a shop or your first Nikes, and that's when you're caught and fall in love with these banks. So why are we not doing the same in crypto? Why are we not fo focusing on the future? My kids have the future. Your kids have the future. We should be focusing on getting them on board in the system. Give them a Bitcoin piggy bank. Give them a Bitcoin debit card. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have this gap. Debit cards, 18 plus years. All the kids below 18 plus years. How can they now use the debit card to step in between? win to get note to get you know to get to in love with bitcoin if they are not 18 plus so there's the first company i found that had this called bitsa in spain and they have a debit card for kids from 14 years old now so i oh, found gosh. this out i got this debit card for the kids so they are using this debit card they are paying with bitcoins everywhere where visa is accepted now so i get my kids the way in this system this way and we should all do the same we should get the kids. You, 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 the you just made me realize I need to get one for my son, Vlad. You know, I need, I need to get him a, a Bitcoin card. He'll, I owe him a birthday present. So, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a I few, send you the, I'll give him a few I will saps. send you the information. <clears throat> I will send you the information about the card. Right. But that's how it is going. You know, all these kids, they have the future. They are playing virtual worlds. You know, they are playing in, I don't know how, how you call all these worlds, Roblox and uh, no, virtual Minecraft worlds, yeah, sure. In these virtual worlds, they already pay with cryptocurrencies, but they are not called cryptocurrencies. So they will, for them, it's normal in five years' time to use it. So we need to educate them. We need to involve them in this industry. 
I think that's the second thing we are doing wrong and the rest, I think we are doing a great job. We, we are all loving this industry and we are all working for like literally no salary. <laughs> Just well, talking. I don't know about that, my friend. <laughs> no, I am. Well, yeah, but, uh, actually, you're, you're right. It's not for a salary because salary would yeah. imply that I'm employed by someone else and has something I can rely on. Yeah. You know, the, I haven't had a salary for quite some time. You know? <laughs> yeah, life life is kind of challenging that way. And it, you know, it, it just occurred to me if you, by the way, if you if if you did your mining in 2013. Yeah. You were, I think, before a lot of the Bitcoin forks. You, I think you were before, yeah. you know, you were, I think you were before Bitcoin Cash and yeah, yeah, the, the split of Bitcoin Cash and the split and split and split. And Bitcoin Cash, of course, is splitting again now. Yeah. So to the extent you have that stuff or held on to that stuff, you're, you don't just have BTC, you, you even have Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. So I know, I know. <laughs> be, st be still my beating heart. So... But, it, but you, you also let in, or let's look there, that you know, for you, you used BTC. So I think like you, you with this in your shirt, you kind of treat them synonymously. Do you, what, what are your feelings about, is there one Bitcoin or are these forks, are these forks distractions? Besides for the fact they make you more money and give you more resources, are they distractions in, in atomizing our efforts or are they good things? And yes, I'm, I'm taking this conversation to like a potential danger zone, but I know no, you can no, handle it. No, it's a danger zone as well, because, you know, I, I grew into this industry as well. So I, I think I, I walked the same path as everybody else is walking. And, and you, you, the moment you see this Bitcoin um, um, hard fork, the first mm -hmm. question is, what is a hard fork? You know, I didn't know at that time. I didn't know what was happening because I'm not a technical guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a commercial guy. Um, so, so you at that point, you just think that's like a scam, you know, I can't get money for free. That's the mm -hmm. first thought you, that comes to mind at that point. You, they are not going to give me uh, Bitcoin cash for free, but then they get, they give you Bitcoin cash for free. You get the same amount that you have or hold all in your, in your Bitcoin wallet. So I, I just went through the whole same, you know, um, uh, education phases that everybody went through in this whole uh, scenery. And I never made up a mind if I'm a Bitcoin maximalist or not, because for me, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. For me, it's one goal. And the goal is to maximize the output of the efforts we as a community have. And if I need to use Bitcoin in America, I will use it over there. Or if I need to use Litecoin in Las Vegas, I will lose Litecoin over there. And if I need to use Dash in Thailand and Bangkok, because it's popular, I will use Dash over there. I have never understood why we have all these fights. You know, this, is, this seems to me as divide and conquer. Why? We need to work together to disrupt the system. So why, I can understand you don't, um, that, that you, you split from Bitcoin and that you want to be Bitcoin cash because you think it then it really is focusing on becoming a peer-to-peer -peer cash instead of a store of value, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Then don't fight, focus on that and make it peer-to-peer -peer cash. And you, Bitcoin, do what you want. But why throw mud at each other? Why are we creating these, hooligan camps of, uh, you know, <laughs> these Twitter wars and all that stuff. I have never understood this because for me, the true fundamentals is to decentralize the world mm -hmm. and to make people trust each other again without having a third party in between. Well, let, let, me, we, let me throw this at you. I, I think there's a little bit of a self-selection dynamic going on, which is the, the kind of personality <laughs> that would embrace Bitcoin and crypto is you know it's not you're, you're not a random sample of the population it's a self-selected group and that self-selected group is going to have a cluster of personality traits often yeah. that you're not going to find with everyone else you know whether it's independent thinking or, or f the system or you know you're not the boss of me yeah. like you know there, there there's there, there's there can be a stronger tendency within our community than in the general yeah. population so that stronger tendency is going to have stronger feelings about this technology than your average person on the street and stronger feelings about what can, where it's going, what it can do and how much time we have to accomplish it. And if you feel yeah. the time is short, perhaps you can yeah. get passionate about what, you, what we might perceive as someone throwing a wrench in the works. Yeah. So, and I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying I, I can understand the heightened emotions in this group because you have to have heightened emotions anyways to get into this in the first place. Yeah. You know I mean? I, I completely agree with you there, Gordon. And you know, you know, the only thing that I differ probably from many other people is that mm -hmm. I don't pretend to have this special power 
to change the world in the way I want to change it. I just go with the flow. I don't swim and get the stream. This is my secret. I, I, don't, I, I don't think I can change what is now in front of me. It took 13.8 billion years from the Big Bang till now that I see you, that I see the sea on the back of this laptop. Mm -hmm. Who am I to think that I can change this? So everything that happens, happens in my opinion for a reason. There's all these hard forks, they happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's the reaction you as a community give is, is exactly what was wrong. The same as the reaction on what happened with this flu. The flu happened. We couldn't stop this from happening, but the reaction, we could have changed that one. And that's the same with crypto and the hard forks. These forks, they happen because of greed, because of fights, because of all that stuff that happened internally in a, in, inside this team. But we as outsiders, we can only just, you know, give a positive reaction to this and take this whole scene um, on a higher level together. Mm -hmm. And this is what I, I just didn't understand that why that these fights were made. And that was exactly that I understood at that point, this whole Bitcoin industry started because of a few people that had a very revolutionary mindset of disrupting the monetary system for the better. And as long as this group kept the same, the nose in the same directions, changing the world, mm -hmm. everything was fine. The moment we mm -hmm. as crypto community evolved from a revolutionary group of people into very individual wealth accumulating people, this is exactly when the fight started. The collective wasn't important anymore. The goal wasn't important anymore. The egos became important. And exactly when those egos became important, the front people of all these new Bitcoin forms, that is when the fighting started. They didn't think in the, at the they didn't think about the big goal anymore. They just thought about ego. I want to be the leader of Bitcoin Cash. I want to be the leader of Satoshi Vision. No, I am Satoshi. I, and that is exactly when all these fights. You know that, he, that the person whose name we're not going to use, he is Satoshi. You should know this. You should, you know, he has it's a copy. Just, he has a copyright. I mean, once you get a copyright, it's, but it's done, the, right? I, I did a YouTube show yesterday with his sister. I think she is Satoshi. She was wearing this shirt. I am Satoshi. Satoshi is female. <laughs> I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Don't even start with that. Yeah, I got it. Well, but yeah, it's an know, interesting I, point. I, I, okay. In the end, it, in the end, it will evolve. It will evolve to a new monetary system, and we are just all here to witness this. And I think we need to be happy to witness this, because you, you, we are living a, revol a revolution, in my opinion. You know, for the internet revolution, I was just too young, but this is going to be this is insane. This is our revolution. Do you? Yeah. Do you think that central bank digital currencies are a furtherance or a positive development in this revolution, or are they sort of like the, the counter revolution? No, I think they are very positive because out of stupidness, they are positive, I think. Because, you know, in, in my opinion, I've been, okay. research, you know, I've been traveling this world now for, for four years and meeting and greeting a lot of people just like you. And, and, and you, you taste the difference between all the people over the world. And now this whole flu situation made me even more understand that 99% of the people live out of fear. They don't live out of passion or following their dreams. They live out of fear. They make their decisions daily out of fear. Mm -hmm. they, they choose for left because they, they think that, right could, that the right side could go wrong. They don't, they don't choose for left because left is the beautiful side. Mm -hmm. So if this is true, then we can create kick-ass entertainment, media, marketing. We can even have trams driving to Hong Kong with Bitcoin or, you know, whatever they are all doing. I, I, I think that's, I, I saw that photo of yours, by the way. I saw that video. Beautiful. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as people live out of fear, mm -hmm. these people will never take the deep dive into Bitcoin. So I say, perfect. Let those central banks now do it. Create a central digital currency. Mm. create a central European currency, the digital yuan is already there. And then they will, that is the first step. They will, dis, they will create these decentralized currencies, digital mm. currencies, sorry. Second step, they will delete physical cash. So then everybody in the world will be depending on digital currency, centralized digital currency. And at that moment, when everybody is on board of this digital train and nobody has the physical cash anymore, most people 
will only then understand, oh shit, I need an alternative if I want to do something private. Oh shit, I need an alternative if I want to do something that I used to do with physical cash. Mm -hmm. Because 99% of the people cannot foresee the future. They can only act on what happens on that day. They, they, they don't believe the same things we are believing. So they need to be in a situation of not having physical cash anymore or any other ways of paying till they understand that they are completely, completely stuck in a digital currency system by centralized organizations that can push the button and mm. can freeze your money everywhere, every time, whenever they want. And that is when the 99% of the people will understand, oh shit, now I need something new. What is it? What? Oh, let's Google. Oh, Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, Litecoin. Oh, Dash. So I think it will evolve, but it will take more time. And it's just not because we don't do our good job, but it's just because 99% of the people live in fear and will never take a deep jump. They, they, they just need to evolve like they evolved with credit cards. It took 12 years before many people used plastic cards because he was just afraid to use it. My grandma went into the bank. Mm -hmm. That took 20 years. So we, who are we to expect Bitcoin to succeed in 11 years? This will take 20 years before everybody will understand and accept it as normal. No, you're so, right. No, yeah. I'm not in a hurry. I, I actually, I, my grandmother, you know, God bless her soul, she's not with us anymore, but you know, she experienced the Great Depression and the idea of using a credit card was an anathema to her. She would never do it. And uh, the, the whole idea of living in debt was, you know, maybe she's right, by the way, but uh, it was just so counter to her way of thinking. The demographics had to move on, I think. It's some people you, you, won't you won't ever get, and maybe you shouldn't, that the demographics have to move on. People have to be exposed to new things. And you're right, the, the idea of a central authority having the ultimate say about whether you can access your own money, that has political implications. You know, if someone, you know, if a, if a dissident in a certain large East Asian country can't pay rent, or can't buy food or can't buy a flight because the wallet is yeah. locked for those purposes, then that has free speech consequences. But that is exactly what is happening. Right. But 99% of the people won't believe it. Even if they see in the news mm -hmm. that China has a social credit system, they won't believe it. In China, yeah. 20,000 people last year were not allowed to fly because they didn't have enough social credits. It's not a storybook. It's not a movie. It's happening. You, you know what? Um, normally, I would yap on for a lot longer, but this, the second half of the show, which is probably the better half of the show, is when I shut up a little bit more and the alumni speakers jump in and banter with our esteemed guest. And you just naturally led into a topic that's near to dear, near dear to Luke Stokes' heart. Luke, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know if I see your smiling face, but I, I don't know if you're actually available. I guess we'll find out extremely quickly. Uh, Luke, oh, there he is. So Luke was kind enough to um, organize a show with two of his compatriots. Uh, maybe one of them will come on here also. There's Vinay Gupta and Xavier Hawk. It, Luke Stokes helped arrange a show on reputation and identity. And I, I think by the time it was done, like I, I, I was having to sweep up the embers because the controversy got so intense at that point. It was... Yeah, it was fun. So, Luke, I'm, I'm, thank you for coming on as always. We, we appreciate it. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for a moment? Say hi to sure. each other and then talk about, you know, the, uh, Didi, social, the it, system in China. Yeah. Go ahead, please. It's super good to meet you. I, I've, you know, obviously followed the story. I've been in crypto since early 2013. I have a, fam a family man as well. I've got three kids. Uh, absolutely love the inspiration you brought to the community and, and your story has been phenomenal. So I, I really appreciate you. And it's just really great to see your, your energy and your spirit and everything you bring. It's like, I call them multidimensional thinkers. And when you connect with one, you're like, oh my gosh, cool. Another one. That's fantastic. So thank you for coming on the show. It's su super great to hear your story. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Luke Stokes. I'm the managing director currently for something called FIO, the Foundation for Infra Wallet Operability. We're just trying to make crypto easier for everybody. You know, human readable names with request functionality and metadata. Uh, so it's just like Luke at Stokes. You can send any crypto you want to it or request crypto from it. Um, but yeah, in that in that conversation, is it related to like identity and reputation? You know, it's it's I love the way you talked about it's how we respond to things. You know, it's like this is an incredible tool 
because there's so many you know, billion people plus that can't access financial systems because they don't have any type of identity. They, they don't have like a passport or a, a water bill for utility to prove their residency you know, or, or anything like that. And so I get very passionate and excited about, hey, you know, I, I'm all about you know, money for the unbanked. This, 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 this is the original vision that got me excited. And I, you know, so I've been, I've been really interested in reputation systems, identity systems. I've been involved with EOS DAC for a couple of years now, building DACs and DAOs, decentralized autonomous communities. But, and the reason I brought uh, Xavier and Vinay on, I, I also consider them multidimensional thinkers, uh, but they also have been involved in these type of things and have seen them go bad. Like Xavier talked about, he gave a talk in China and, and the Chinese government literally like crafted the system that you were just describing off of information that he believes they like detailed information they got from his talk. And that really concerned him as someone who cares about freedom and liberty and autonomy and everything that we all you know, love on this show. Um, so I guess I wanted your thoughts as well. Like, yes, it's a tool, like it's a brick, right? We could build a, build a house or break a window. This idea that the blockchain could be used for immutable, provable identity and reputation but it's also really, really scary. You get a totalitarian government who controls that. And now, like you were describing, you can't get on a plane. You can't buy bread for your children. You know, it gets really bad. Uh, so I was just curious, what are your thoughts on reputation identity as it relates to the blockchain? I, I fully agree with you. you know, I, I even made a video about it, I think, uh, two weeks ago. And I told uh, people, I asked people, okay, you, we all love blockchain. But did we ever think about how negative it could involve in the world as well? You know, because... You know, blockchain for the good is the thing that I believe in, but we need to admit that all, also decentralized organizations now they already are using it. You know, they are going to use it for all our identities. You know, all our passports will become digital, will be stored on this blockchain, and they will use. You know, I don't know if you believe in it, but I think they want to have this digital world before 2030, and I think blockchain is going to be the tool they have been missing for years. So they understand now, finally, oh shit, this tool, <laughs> what we thought was a scam, we can use it even more, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, you can see it now. For example, for me, the biggest example um, is this whole flu situation. I was in shock to read on Cointelegraph <laughs> that there are people in this blockchain industry developing blockchain tools to track people if they are sick or not, you know, with this COVID thing. I'm like, guys, <laughs> you're a developer. Please focus on something cool that is decentralizing the world and not centralizing the power of the governments because of the flu. But that is how this whole industry has changed. They just want to make money. And that's why they just build what the governments want. And that's the only solution they have because you know everybody's still completely attached to money. And that is exactly the difficult part for me as a family. We want to show that this is exactly not the thing to be detached to. But on the other hand, we talk about Bitcoin, which is kind of a replacement of money. And that is a difficult part. So yes, I think we will, we will get a lot of problems because of the blockchains in the future. Because if, if I, I, I did a research in the China part and it's not only you know, the, the flights because I, I love flying. So for me, that would be a problem that you cannot fly. But it's also, you know, it's, it, it's gone this far in China that people that don't have enough social credits, they can't get bank loans, they can't get a good job, they can't book a hotel even with luxury status. They this, this is almost a sci-fi, you know, movie from Netflix episode. Oh yeah, this, it's, uh, it's, you know, we always say that, it's Black Mirror. We, Black Mirror, yes, yeah. and it's, but it's, it's kind of true. And I think, if, if you want to talk about identity, um, I think that in China, they did it the hardcore way, they just said, let, let's say the, the dictatorship way, we just do it. And in Europe and in the States, they created the same effect, but on a soft way by getting all, all, all our kids addicted to social media. Mm. Because what is the difference between social media and a social credit system? Nothing. My kids think that their online avatar is more important than their offline appearance. So they buy digital mics, NFTs to pimp their avatar, to create social credibility because they think when they are online social credible, they are doing good in the world. So this is the same result. Only the China is force it <laughs> and the Western, the, you have the pull and the push strategy in marketing. And the Chinese have the push strategy and the European and the Western side, they, we use the pull strategy. So they pull the kids into the social media system 
where they can't live without it anymore. They want to be social credited. They want to have likes. They want to have thumbs up. They want to have, you know, so they are already followed completely because of Facebook, Instagram. The only step that we as Western societies need to take to become the same as China is to mm-hmm. change the law, maybe use a, a law that we can use like temporarily, like they just did now with the flu. <laughs> yeah. Let's change the law for some time. And then they can change the law that they can track everybody. So that would well, there's the a Russian the expression, law. which is there's nothing more permanent than a temporary thing. Exactly. But that is what they yeah. are doing. Yeah. So they have the data. They all have the crypto data already because we all know that Coinbase and everything is paying and sending everything to the IRS. You know? So, every, so it's, it, this world is changing too fast in the wrong direction. And that's, that's yeah, what I hope to try to educate more and more people about. But um, it's difficult. So, it's difficult. L- l- let me bring in Xavier Hawk. Xavier, we were, we were, as you know, discussing you in absentia. Well, welcome on. Xavier is part of the, the bloodbath that Luke helped organize. Um, <laughs> Xavier. I thought it was awesome. It's me, meet a fellow wild man. You guys both got similar like <laughs> rebel vibe. I love it. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. I saw that in the, in the, in the paperwork. I, uh, I just cut my hair, actually. I, I had long hair like Didi. Um, yeah, it's my birthday today. So I was, I was actually oh, wow. just taking- That's right. That's Happy, birthday. Happy birthday, Xavier. Happy birthday, Xavier. Cool. Yeah, good to meet you, Didi. Good to meet you as well. And the, I love this hairstyle as well. So it it's actually- me- it it's actually a mohawk still. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can tell, but uh, I, I kept it like as a mohawk, but I can, I can make it look nice. Yeah. <laughs> cool. cool. So uh, Xavier, t- talk to us about, yeah, you, you, you probably caught the end of it. Talk about, to us about social credit, reputation, identity, what, what you hope for, what you fear. And well, what I hope go. for is, is definitely a voluntary system, a system that operates so efficiently and beautifully that people actually want to be a part of it, that it's representative of all of the people and able to provide um, a consensus. You know, we can determine what everybody wants in a real-time, uh, real-time way in a secure blockchain voting system and then be able to execute on that will. Right now, it's sort of like there is no technological capability of the people of the planet to get together and say, we want this, whatever that is. We want more schools. We want a cleaner planet. Like everybody wants those things, but there's no efficient way to communicate those desires um, or execute them on. You know, it's just sort of like, oh, we trust that the governments know that we want good stuff and they don't. Right. <laughs> so if we are able to have a voice and say that and demonstrate it clearly, then the people that we have to represent us or to be the janitors of the world, essentially, like our governments are supposed to be janitors. You know, we want a clean world. We want it running efficiently. We want to be safe. So uh, we need a system that allows us to, to, to choose representatives, recall them as soon as they step out of line um, and hold them accountable and make sure that they're doing their jobs. Right. And if we, we have that system right now, um, we do. Uh, it just needs to be. It needs to be funded essentially. And it doesn't need. And it not, we should not focus with this system now on the people, but we should focus on the politicians first, because you know they need to lead by example. So let's get all the politicians on this system, and let's let us vote on the politicians with all the smart contracts and all the things that they promised to us in the system. So when we vote for a politician, he is bound to do the things that a smart contract, smart contract yeah. needs to do. So yeah, yeah. Of course, we, then we do it top down. I, I, I truly believe this. On if, the other if, hand, sorry, if, if, if they, like we need to be able to rate our politicians like we can products on Amazon, right? If like, and, and the minute their approval rating drops below a certain thing, they lose their tokenized access to the, the, their job functions within the, within the system. Okay, so exactly. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be just Mr. Devil's Advocate guy and David Johnson knows, David, thank you for joining. <laughs> David Johnson knows that I love doing this. So I don't necessarily take everything I say as me endorsing this idea. It's just me just being me. So Xavier, you immediately created a concern in my mind about some populist person telling people what they want to hear to maximize their votes. You know, some, we may even have that now in the United States, heaven forbid, you know, and, and just kind of running with it and gaming the system just because of the potentially short attention span of, pe- of people. And I, I think maybe one of the benefits of the rep, of a representative system of government where people have set terms is you buffer against the emotions of the, of the moment. 
So well, if you're going to downplay well, somebody or if you're going to rate somebody poorly, it has to cost you something, right? Because it, if it doesn't, it's just like, oh, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You know, it's like, no, if, if you're going to um, try to take somebody out, you know, lower their score or rating, whatever, then it's going to cost you something to do that as well, whether it's money or ratings on your own score. Um, you know, the, the, like, what you're bringing up is the problem that's happening in China, right? It's like, this is a top-down control structure where if you step out of line out of communist manifesto, then you can't travel, you can't buy food, you can't get groceries. And this is the horrible thing that's, that, this, that this could happen, right? Um, what it has to be in, in order to, to make a checks and balances where the people are in control, they have to be educated. So they can't vote and or decide on things unless they go through like a Kajabi style uh, training where they have to watch videos, answer some questions. Okay, now you know enough about the material to make a decision, right? So there's I, two I, ways. I, sorry, I'm just gonna be me and I'm just gonna throw it at you. So the, you know, there, there was but in the United States and, you know, after slavery ended and but before blacks actually had civil rights, one of the, one of the buffers that the under the Jim Crow laws to keep them from voting was these literacy tests, you know, and where the, the requirement that, you know, okay, well, we're, you know, of course, we're gonna let you vote, but you, you need to, we're gonna need to confirm that you're a good citizen. So, you know, you have to pass this test. And this is a test I think that what most white Americans in 2020 would have trouble passing. So the- well, Yeah, I, then they I, can't I, vote. Like, like if they can't, if they can't be educated about a topic, uh, then they, they should have no say in that topic. Well, yeah, do, do you hear what I'm saying? Black, the, brown, the, yellow, purple, white, it doesn't matter. But, but still, the, go the, 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 but still go at the end, it, it, go ahead. Even, even if we are talking still about voting for a president or whatever, we don't need to vote for that guy anymore. If we live in a decentralized world, the majority votes for a solution. Right. It's, it's again, we're not voting for people anymore. We are going to vote for a solution. We have a problem as a country, we have a COVID problem. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? We, solve it, we can solve it by doing A, B, or C. You yeah. let the country vote. Because the presidents and all the politicians all over the world, we, we, we voted for them because we believe that they were a good representative of our community. Right. That they are not being this good representative is the problem. So we should not be voting for a person to be a representative of our ideas. We should be voting for ideas. This is decentralizing the world. Yeah, uh, I mean, one comment, then I'm going to have Dave jump in, and then I'm going to have Marco jump in also. And uh, we actually got Alexis on here, too. We're going to go for it. So, oh, yeah. You, you, one more thing, because I just want to say one more thing, because, okay. you know, guys, it's, it's so easy. We have apps for everything in the world. If, if, if we are missing a child somewhere in the world, you get an Amber Alert in a, in a text in 10 seconds. How easy is it to ask me, should we build a wall between Mexico and America? And then let the, let, let, like, a billion people in the world decide. Oh, you right. have your answer. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna exert host privilege and devil's advocate role and just kind of throw back <laughs> because that, you know, I just like doing this stuff. The, okay, I, I, there's a benefit to the referendum system, which is kind of what you're talking about. Switzerland has it, California has it. It's been useful. And the reason it got implemented, you know, Switzerland's always had it, but the reason it got implemented in California with our proposition system, the most famous of which is Proposition 13 about property taxes. The reason it got implemented is that all these homeowners were getting screwed over on their property taxes. They could not get relief through the regular uh, legislative system. And so we moved to the proposition system, which is basically the referendum system. The, the problem that I see from my perspective living here is that each one of these referendums, they, they may or may not make sense, but the number one, it lets certain groups of lobbyists do end runs around the normal legislature by making propositions that sound good, submitting them to popular vote. And then now the legislature has to live with them. That's number one. Number two, each one becomes like an axiom, something that is assumed to be true. Well, the, when you have one axiom, it's easy. But the moment you have more than one axiom, you introduce the idea that these axioms may conflict. Two true statements that may not be worked together or may not integrate well. And at some point when that happens, you, you need human beings to interpret these things and try to reconcile them. So I, I, I don't know if you can get away from the human involvement, even with referendums or axioms or voting for a wall or not voting for a wall. Because at the end of the day, you know, we've got someone voting for a wall, we got also someone saying, you know, pay for schools and you have X amount of money and you can't pay for both. Someone has to decide what to do. And 
you know, uh -huh. there's, like, there's expression like character is destiny. You, I don't know if you can necessarily micromanage people's decisions, but I think you can select people based on who they are, give them a general guidelines and say, please act in accordance with your character with respect to these set of problems. So that, that's my pushback on the, on voting up or down an idea as opposed to a person. So, so then if, if, we would, if we would take that idea or vision you have, that would mean that all the money that you pay in Texas would be invested in positive parts and not in police and military force and to create fights and wars? Because that is what it takes. Well, how, how do you get there from what I said? So you, you're saying that we need, we, we should, you, you, you're saying we need a centralized person to- No, no, not, not centralized. I, 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 love the, I love the decentralized, massively, God, David, I want to get you in here. I love the massive decentralized nature of US and Swiss government and EU to a certain extent with this subsidiary principle. I probably mispronounced it. I'm not saying a authority. I'm not saying the dictator, okay? okay. I, I, I'm, I'm saying that when you vote in a rule as opposed yeah. to a person or a group of people, okay, that has a function, has a place. It's a referendum system. But the problem you hit is the moment you have more than one, if you treat each referendum as an axiom, thou shalt do this, thou mm -hmm. shalt build a wall, thou shalt fund schools, thou shalt do whatever. Okay, any one of those can exist, but the moment you have two, you introduce the possibility of those two goals conflicting somehow because there's not infinite resources in the universe. All right. No, but you know, why is well, that? But that's a joke. That's a joke. We are printing money every day. Well, money, but we're, we're taking available money. wealth and slicing <laughs> it more finely every day. But I don't know if we're creating wealth. All right, David. <laughs> yeah, okay. David, go. <laughs> so, guys, I love. And, the sorry, and introduce content. yourself yeah, just yeah. for everyone. And then David Johnston uh, coined the term dApps in the early days of crypto, um, did BitAngels, did uh, Ethereum early on, a bunch of, a bunch of stuff, uh, supported a bunch of early protocols. Anyway, um, I love the core concept of having actual connection between the promises made during a campaign and the actual execution of those promises, right? That is something you know, sorely missing in American politics, like free ponies and, you know, pie on Tuesday during the campaign. And then afterwards, like there's no intention and fall and falling through. In fact, it's so cynical. A lot of times they'll promise things they never want to deliver because then they can't promise it in the next campaign. Right. It's that cynical. Right. So I get the core concept. Um, I think we're missing a couple of things. Um, you need more brains, right? There are 435 people anointed with the magic power to create legislation. There was an idea at the beginning of this republic called the Amendment of the First, which would have set a number of people per representative, initially at 25,000 and capped at 50,000, right? And as a result, today you would have thousands of representatives in the US Congress. Instead, the Congress arbitrarily capped it at 435. So if anybody wants to have a lot of fun, there, there's already eight states that have approved the amendment of the first in its original form from the Continental uh, Congress and, and, and from when they, they uh, put forth the amendment. And if they wanted to really have some fun, they'd go to the other states and get it passed and force the country to upgrade from 435 to thousands of representatives. Then you'd actually have a chance of knowing meeting and actually talking to a person with this magical power of making legislation. The second point I want to make though is the danger is every time the masses can say, ah, it would be great if this happened. There's a lot of things people shouldn't be able to vote on, like issues of my free speech. One of the beautiful things about the US is what government can't do. It can't tell me my religion. It can't tell me I can't defend myself. It can't tell me I have certain political speeches that I can't give, right? The amazing thing is part of what it carved out that can't be voted on by everybody. So as we build these systems, let's just keep in mind the beauty of a lot of these systems is what they can't do, not just what they can do. That's, that's my soapbox. Can I add yeah. something to that? The, the federalist system that came about in like the early 1900s, late 18s was, where, it used to be where if your senator or your congressman did something you didn't like, you could, literally get enough people in your state together and bring them back and be like, you can't do that, we're putting somebody else. Then it became more centralized and more federalized and you couldn't do that and all of a sudden you saw the rampant corruption start going through. 
what I really dig about what David just said and, and my heritage, you know, prior to my, my father's side of the family coming here is the Swiss. They have a very decentralized system. You can know your representatives, right? There's 10 different cantons. There's 10 different presidents. They all rotate on a rotate. So that no centralized control can really be built into that system unless it's ideological and unless it is built on actual relationships and, and purpose that the, that the people have, the decentralized will of the people. What we're talking about is how do we garner the, the actual consensus will of the planet or the, the nations and, and then execute upon those properly without allowing corruption to come in? Yeah. Didi, I, I think I, this, is, this is getting hardcore. So, yeah, but I, I, you know, you, you asked like, me to come on, what? <laughs> no, 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 it's good. But you know, there, there's Didi, which is like, Bitcoin family love peace everywhere. And oh, then, totally. And, like so, we're one of the but, same cloth. But, 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 but I, 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 I fully agree with him, but we should even, you know, it's, it's, it should even start with the transparency of knowing what people voted, who voted. Yeah, yeah. We don't even see it. You know, I think we are so blind, Gordon, and I'm sorry, but, do uh, by the really way, Vinay Gupta is coming on, so now things are going to get hardcore. Okay, go <laughs> on. Do we, do we really believe that what they tell us is true? Do, do we really believe if they vote for Trump and, the, and he had the majority of votes, they, who, who counted these votes? Do we really believe this system? Do we believe, really believe the numbers and flu deaths? I, I, I believe that the electoral wanna, college but, no, but was... That, that's the first part, I think, yeah. that needs to digital, uh, decentralized and be transparent. I want to see. I want to see and be able to see every little vote on everything. And then I can believe. Accountability, exactly. And that is exactly what the b blockchain tool is bringing us. It's a if tool. If it's built right, and if it's built by the right people, there was a comment in the chat saying it, 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 the, it's manipulatable by who frames yeah. the question and who creates the education yeah. sources. So it has to be That's true, built. I think. There has to be some, and, and let me give you one example, and then I will shut up because I talk too much. Because in the Netherlands, there was this rule created temporarily because if you were together with too many people, you get a fine of $400 because of the flu. $400. You know, Gordon, yeah. thousands of people in the Netherlands were not, no millions of people, were not able to celebrate a funeral, to celebrate a marriage, to visit their grandmas. And then we have one guy in the Holland, who created this, and the, the number one politician in Holland who created this, he celebrates his um, his marriage. Oh, don't tell me! Inviting forty people, his yeah. grandma, handshaking, hugging, on television, and he's not being punished. He's not being fined. He even he is only saying, "Oh, sorry, oh, guys." Like Nancy Pelosi here in the States. She's like, nobody can go anywhere and get their haircuts. And she goes and gets her haircut, no mask. Not possible. I, then is where accountability steps in and you lose your job. Gone. That, exactly. that, remi that reminds 80%. me of the, of the check cashing scandal. Yes. You know. yeah. uh, Vinay, you, you claim to have oh. only four minutes. <sighs> but yeah, just about to go into another call, but you said pop on. So, hey, you got me for five minutes. Well, uh, <laughs> we, 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 got, we got the band back together again, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, the, the band, you know. <laughs> For like that final show. <laughs> Weapons gate troublemakers, one and all. It's like the uh, Seven Samurai, only weirder. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't even, you know, I don't even know how to frame this, Luke. Fr fr frame this topic, but not not just what we talked about before, but with Didi's kind of integrated point. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I, I think I think you know we've been kind of restarting the conversation we had previously. Didi has a perspective of a digital nomad and uh, yeah. freedom and love for family. It's amazing. It's awesome. I love the positive energy he brings. And, and he kind of agrees with me that, you know, these are tools. It depends on how we use them. It's similar to what Xavier just said. It depends on who builds them. But, you know, maybe bring a little of the doom and gloom. Like, what are the concerns? Like voting, for example, if everybody voted, you know, then you could actually, that could become a tool because now you know your identity and I could restrict your ability to vote and I could control you in certain oh. ways. So what are the things that we should be aware of while not losing the positive energy? I think that's the key. Oftentimes, you know, Vinay, you bring this doom and gloom darkness, and yeah. Didi brings the light and love and peace that we need. It's like, no, oh, none of that. Yeah, Didi's real. making me oh, smile. No, no, delusion, delusion. Um, so, the, I mean, the bottom line with this is that the existing systems are really pretty sophisticated, right? Like, you know, paper ballots, much as we give paper ballots a hard time, um, it's very hard to do large scale fraud on paper ballots. 
right? It's really difficult. Um, and certainly a lot of bad people have put a lot of time and work into building the systems that allow them to do large scale fraud on paper ballots, but it certainly doesn't start out easy. Um, so anytime we're gonna build a system that has this kind of cryptographic element to it, you have to make sure that you cannot get into either vote selling or posthumous uh, or retroactive punishment for how people voted, right? So you need a system where the voter can prove that they voted and can demonstrate to other people that their vote wasn't counted if it wasn't counted, but that they can't prove to anybody else how they voted, right? And that sounds kind of impossible, but David Chom figured it out. Uh, he had a system called Three Vote, which was paper ballots with some clever hacks that allowed you to use cryptographic techniques to make sure that the paper ballots were counted, but didn't give you a way of proving which way you voted. Um, so it's, you know, it, there's an interesting middle ground where if you've got the right kind of know-how, you can create voting systems that have cryptographic security, but also all the guarantees that we get from the paper world. Uh, and John, well, what's interesting about what you said, though, is I think Didi and others were, were touching on the accountability aspect of holding oh, yeah. people accountable to bad decisions. But yeah. if we're able to hide that because if we want to protect someone, that seems to be a conflict of, of goals. Well, I mean, this gets into the question of whether we still have equal justice under law. And, you know, it, it's very clear that we don't, right? We, we all have the perception that we're basically run by criminals, and it doesn't matter which part you vote for, they're still criminals. And I don't think you're going to get out of that without burning the whole thing down to the ground and starting over with a fresh bunch of people. Okay, um, I, I'm just going to break, brother. I'm just, I'm just gonna break right in here. Is Xavier still here? Xavier. In, and David, too. In Switzerland, are they run by a bunch of criminals? They're, of course. Well, hey, hey, you're, you're, excuse me, your, name, your, name, your name is not David and your name is not Xavier. David and Xavier, in Switzerland, are they run by a bunch of criminals? They're surprisingly uncorrupt, and I, I think it has a lot to do with competition in parties, checks between multiple uh, houses that have to pass, and extremely local representation. You know, uh, it's as close to a non-state as exists in the world today. It is the most decentralized system that exists. It's not perfect, but, and I just want to draw the distinction. Uh, Vinay, um, they're mostly talking earlier about how do we keep politicians accountable? And mm. you're talking about the secrecy required so that people can't trample the guy that voted the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we have to differentiate yeah. between the voter, right, taking on that role, and the politician who probably does need public transparency and oh, accountability. Absolutely. I mean, you know my standard thing, right? In privacy is for individuals. You know, corporations and governments get transparency. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that the, not to disparage the Swiss, but I think that power or they, they've done us a great job of decentralizing the power and making them accountable. So that, that diminishes the potential for, you know, rampant corruption. Whereas here in the States, it's like, there's so many hidden alleyways and, and places that you can do terrible shit in the government that, you know, it's hard to hold them accountable. Yeah. I think that, you know, it, and so in, in, in terms of creating a system that, that creates that accountability, yes, anybody who has purview or influence or their sphere of influence touches you, then you have the right to, uh, to, to gauge them, whether they're doing a good job or not, and they are accountable to you. Um, that, that was the point that I wanted to make regarding that. Okay, um, chaps, uh, I got a dash because uh, I got a call starting now. Lovely to see you, however, briefly. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. Don't get caught. <laughs> Don't get caught. Bye, man. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. That's awesome. D D Didi. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't even know what to ask you next, next but I, I feel like I want to ask you for a comment or just throw something into the mix or just go for it. No, 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 man. I love, I love, I, man, I'm so happy I'm on this show. I'm so happy to meet all these people because I'm going to stay in contact because I just found a few people that are going to fight this revolution together with me as well. Because, you know, it's, it's about the goal and we need multiple different thinking people to reach that goal. It's not, if ever, everybody would be the same like me, we will never reach this goal. And if everybody was saying the same like you, we will also not reach the goal. So we need a beautiful mix of people. To, you know, it's the same like a soup. If you want to create a very tasteful soup, you need a lot of ingredients and yeah. then you cook it to a beautiful soup and then everybody will love it. Well, the, the we my speaker channel on Telegram is <laughs> your new home. And Marco. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Yes, sir. You know, say why, where you are, why your shirt's off again. 
<laughs> Again? You mean why haven't I, I put a shirt on, on yet? Baby, shirtless. <laughs> I've never actually seen Marco with a shirt. I know <laughs> neither have I. <laughs> I'm not sure he owns one. But uh, oh no, I got a closet full because I moved here from from Toronto, so I got lots of clothes. I just don't have to wash them right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> good, good job. Um, uh, there's so many topics that have been brought up here that is just uh, amazing. Um, to, to extend Vinay's comment about uh, individuals need to be accountable and governments and corporations need to be transparent. I, ex I kind of extended that a little further in the model that we're trying to get built. Um, and we're having a little inter architectural hiccup on it, but we're getting there. Um, and that is that individuals are always accountable relationships are transparent and when you become a customer of a company that's a relationship so you have to be transparent to them and they have to be transparent to you within the context of that relationship and i think when you get to that point uh you still have privacy all around the only people who are involved in the relationship are two whether it's a company or a government or whatever and because of the transparency nature of the uh of the institutional side or the, the collective sides you get watchdogs naturally uh, and those watchdogs are one are the check and check and balance against you know misuse of data misuse of information all that kind of stuff that's on that topic then there's the CDBC one you brought up <laughs> which is uh, there I mean um, oh it, it was it was put out that they're, they're not blockchain right none of these CDBCs are blockchain or CBDCs our blockchain. They're just the, an alternative version to cash that is traceable uh, and controlled by a central bank, which is effectively your government. The thing I find interesting is that once you have the whole world operating on digital currencies, as, as you said, it gets people over that hurdle <clears throat> of understanding of digital system? currency. Say again? I think your question is how do they get out of that system into Bitcoin? Oh, no, I was actually going to propose a solution and ask your thoughts on it. <laughs> Once you've got central bank digital currencies, right, everybody's using them. What's to stop you from launching something? Let's call it a uh, Bitcoin 2 or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter. But where you get into the ecosystem of this new money by staking your CDBC. Well, maybe maybe and the value of that has control over the central bank digital currency. You can't stake it in order to get in. I think that is the that, that is the biggest. Already, I already said what I think what the issue would be. But the biggest issue is that if the government will be completely decentralized, will they allow people to escape that system into Bitcoin? Because now, now if I have my money on the bank and the government doesn't allow me to escape into the system. I cash all my money at an ADM or whatever. I go to a Bitcoin ADM, I buy Bitcoin. Or I cash my money and I buy Bitcoins at localbitcoins.com. But if my money is held by these centralized governments in this centralized digital currency, will there still be a bridge between that one and our one? I think, right. And if, and if, exactly. we, can, if we can now build already something that would be the bridge in between those two worlds, because they are going to exist, coexist, I think then you would have the best company for the next decade. Mm -hmm. so yeah, also, there's, the, there's the case there that it's very difficult to do that if you also want to be able to interchange your CDBC coins internationally, like for you want to change yuan into USDC. Yeah. So, right? so if, and if you then take it back to the core fundamentals of life, and if we will be living this life like this, and we will be agreeing with the voting system and everything, how it is, will happen now, and if you look further 10 years, then we will be fucked. But if we are able to decentralize the world, decentralize these voting systems, then we won't be fucked because then we will be the people that get to vote if these currencies will, to be, will be inter-exchangeable. Because then we have the saying, if Bitcoin can be bought with the central digital currency. If we will not have the say saying in the future because we allow decentralized worlds to exist, we are fucked. And we are Xavier, doing it. I, I feel like we are, you got something to add in there. We, we are already already allowing them to do everything what they want with us, to lock you down, to wear, to wear a face mask, and all what we do as sheeple is just meh, meh. 
we're already being fucked every day. So do, they are going to fuck us over again if we don't wake up. And that's what we need to do as a community. That's why I'm doing this every day. That's why I feel so passionate about it. I want people to wake up and understand this concept in 10 years time, they will be doomed if we do not change now. Yeah. I will leave the, a world. The biggest problem kids. I face there is that the sheep actually like to be sheep. That's the real problem we're facing. Then we need to send them to Mars to have, together with Elon Musk. Send them there, <laughs> whatever, go there. I don't want to leave a world behind yeah. for my kids that looks like that in 10 years time. That's right. And Luke the, the, said something on Twitter recently. You should ask him about that. Xavier. Oh, sorry, Xavier, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. No, it's cool. I, I think that what you're bringing up, Didi, is, is you know, looking into the future. If we're, if we're to take a 40,000 look view at the world right now, we've got two different ideologies that are at, at, at war two different memetics, let's say, communism and, you know, democracy or freedom. And that's either rule by others, right? And it's been creeping into the United States. And we've got this, this concept of like, we want self-determination. A bunch of people said, F you to the queen or the king back in the day. And they started having their own food security, their own power security. And they were like, nobody gets to tell us how to live now. And they fought a war over that. And we have this experiment called the United States, which is like, an experiment in self-determination, right? Uh, rule of the people together deciding like the, the first decentralized, you know, governance system, let's say. I mean, pr uh, after the, the Iroquois Confederacy. So then we're looking at these two ideologies battling with each other. And we sit sort of like in the middle because we're building the tech that will help either side, right? In the sense that there, there is a push for a global government, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, I think that in the, the, I think it's Kardev scale or whatever, where it's like class zero civilization, yeah. class one, we want to have, we want to have a global system with peace where we can start exploring the stars or whatever. And, and children can grow up and expand and grow their souls, right? A soul farm. And what we have right now is a human farm and trying to figure out the most efficient way to farm humanity's energy. And right now it's economic, right? And there are people in charge of that farm who don't, they don't care whether it's a green farm or permaculture or free range. They just want their, their economic horsepower to fuel whatever dreams and CERN or whatever that they want to build. So the, the question becomes, how do we build the systems so that it can't be corrupted and turned into a somebody else farming us, but we are essentially recognizing that we have value and farming ourselves. We collectively say, oh, you know, the transactions is how they've been farming us, whether it's like, uh, you know, MasterCard, Visa, Square, they make a lot of money on us doing business. How do we as a people make a lot of money on us doing business and then decide, you brought up the point about taxation, like how do you make decisions there? If in the United States or any country, for instance, you could check mark, I want a percentage of my money going to the military, percentage going to education, percentage to healthcare, then things would be different, right? So it, in, if, if we had a transaction taxation where we're harvesting the transaction fees by processing all of these people's transactions and then they get to vote on how those that those those monies that we collect get deployed then then we would see we would see the world transform overnight i think yeah exactly you know and, and, and even if you touch the tax form base just one minute about it if you look at the whole tax system it's the most retarded system out there in the world i don't even understand that they even don't see it themselves they yeah. are putting so much money out there to find people that are not paying tax. You know, if you do it the easy way and don't calculate income tax and all these taxes upfront, but only when people spend it, then you are collecting the tax any kind of way people spend, which kind of money they spend. Black right. money, white money, yellow money, doesn't matter. You pay, you spend, you pay tax when you spend, not upfront. So the tax could be solved, I think, in a very easy way. But you know, the thing you're saying, I love it because that's exactly, that brings me to the next step, why I am supporting, for example, Blockchain Valley and House of Dao in Thailand. House of Dao in Thailand, Blockchain Valley in Bulgaria. These two are uh, blockchain communities building a co-working, co-living space for same-minded people that will to accelerate this change in the world. Because all these governments, I think they know kind of which way we are going. But there is not one government, not one country that, that has, the, 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 has the courage to take this first step as an example. You know, we have Liberland trying, but all the other official countries, they don't have, they, they are afraid. So if I, with my collective friends and you and all we can build Blockchain Valley in Bulgaria, a completely decentralized community, mm -hmm. you know, there will be a showcase, a small showcase of how the world could be decentralized, the same we are building in Thailand, 
if we can build 20 power plants all over the world where decentralized crypto communities, blockchain communities are living together, working together, building new decentralized ways of living, that would be an example for governments to follow. And then they could see it. You can invite it to, the, to, their, to that place and you can see, they can see, you know, they can investigate how the transactions go, how the schooling goes, and because they don't have an example. And the only thing these governments have been doing is we create an idea, we create a project, then you invite your people from the government and they, they, you showcase your project and they like it. And then they, they roll it out on, their, on your country. But they don't have an example of a decentralized world. So we need to create this in a small time. And that's why I love and how, how, that I keep saying their names, House of Dow and Blockchain Valley, because they are building this. How's it down, watching Valley? David, you're, you're, you're nodding in a wise way, so thoughts? Well, I, I love that we're putting things into action because what always irritated me in the early 2000s about libertarian discussions, it was just like, and the end solution was more education. Like <laughs> there was no action in the real world that you could take yeah. until Bitcoin exists. And then it was like, oh, you can sell your green pieces of paper for Bitcoin, right? And then it became real. And then we started bootstrapping all of this capital and we see these cool outgrowths like House of Dow and Blockchain Valley and Crypto Valley and all of these things, right? Where people are putting it into, into action. Though I'm less interested in um, worried about convincing governments. Uh, I don't, I'm a little more cynical. I don't think it's because they haven't seen the example. I think it's because their interests and incentives are aligned around concentrating the wealth of other people into their pockets, right? Just economically, if you are a, we're working for the government, you know, 100% of your income is coming from that activity, right? Yeah. And anybody else trying to create incrementally more freedom, maybe it's a difference of a few dollars, a few hundred dollars to them, right? So we have this fundamental uh, challenge where the individuals who are being farmed you know, need to somehow using blockchain to coordinate a way to move their wealth out of the existing system versus the people that are in the existing system and are going to continue that system as long as they are incentivized to do so. So what we need to do is get to this critical tipping point where enough of the wealth has moved onto the new system where it would make more money for that person that was in government to switch yeah. over and go the other way. This is what we saw, right? It wasn't that the US invaded the Soviet Union, the yeah. economy of the Soviet Union just collapsed. And everybody could see that the better stuff and the better music and the better life was in the West. And you got to a critical point where people are like, you know, forget this, like my government job doesn't get me anything, I'm just going to leave or I'm willing to give up that old system, right? So that's what we're in the process of doing. And we still have a long way to go, but I love that the people here are involved in action to actually get us. Yeah, that's, you, you're completely right over there. Yeah, it's indeed, it's not an example. It's just, it's building a new world. Um, and that's what you, you can read on their website. Indeed, it's, it's, They just want to build this new world, but they think that the governments will never allow it. So the focus should be on creating, that's why I said 20 power plants, but if you, because if you create 20 power plants all over the world, you know, that will focus on their region, on showing how it can be living like this, and really giving this example, these regions will grow like oil stains. You know, it will be a small stain, but it will grow bigger and bigger as people will start to get involved in these blockchain valleys, in these house of DAOs. And then, you know, I, I think that is the step, the only way, if you're not going to create a real revolution, you know, and going to kill all the presidents, then this would be the loving and the caring way to do it, yeah. to build communities, you know? And like Buckminster Fuller <laughs> said, build, build the future, don't fight the existing system, build a better one. That's, yeah. And that's exactly why my kids don't go to school. You know, I need to lead by example. I need to show them that. Oh, God, I, I hope my son doesn't them. see this. He's going to be like, Dad, can yeah. you please be cool like Dee Dee? I don't want to go to school. <laughs> It's, it's uh, Sandra, let, let me let me let me let you jump in here for for a second. Not 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 to wrap it up, but just how do you how did you and Didi meet, and what caught your mind about him? Yeah, well, it was really fascinating because I was involved in a project called Momentum Protocol a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and these were some Israeli and techies who are uh, designing a program in the loyalty market. And one of my friends got me involved. He said, you know, they're doing the, the ICO. Have a look at it. And because my background is in, is in marketing and I was attracted to the, to the loyalty marketing uh, 
perspective. So to make a long story short, I dove into that. I bought a chunk of tokens and the guy said, you know, why don't you help us do some promotion? I said, great. So I did it. We did a lot of events in Asia and along uh, uh, doing the, the roadshow, I hear from people in Asia, do you know Didi? And at that time, I didn't know him. I said, who's this Didi? Yeah, he also is from the Netherlands. I said, I have to meet him. So I sent Didi a message, but I'm not the only one who approaches people like Didi. He gets a gazillion messages every day. So we didn't co connect it yet, but one of my um, friends from, let's say, 300 years ago, Vincent, is a mutual friend between the two of us. And I said to him, I said, Vincent, you know, I'm trying to connect because my industry is not from the blockchain or crypto. I come from the the health and well-being industry, but I want to reach out. He said, who do you want to reach out to? I said, to Didi, do you know him? And he said, man, 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 this is not a coincidence. Didi is one of my best friends on a personal level. I said, you're kidding, right? He said, no, no, no. So he picked up his phone. This is Didi. Hey, he said, yeah, this is Vincent. I'm sitting here with Sander. You have to reply to his message. Well, so we shared the, the, the phone. We had a good conversation. And from, let's say the, the first moment on, and I see the same happening now, with you guys, with Xavier, with David, with all the other guys. When you when you hook up with somebody like Didi, he's got an open personality. He's a nice guy. He wants to to give more than what he gets. You know, that, that, that that's he's like really passionate. Uh, and I had the same. So I said to Didi, you know, let's see and discover how we can work together. So we worked together. We did some marketing promotions on the project on Momentum Protocol. Really cool. And since then, we've been let, let's say industry friends. And wherever we can help each other, we do. If we make it. Can, can make introductions, connect people to each other. We do, and of course, as fellow Dutchmen, we always, you know, help each other because we're a small country, but with, with a big vision and we have the entrepreneurial mindset. So th that's how we connected. So I was like really, well, not surprised, but really happy when Gordon texted me a couple of days ago. He said, you know, our speaker for upcoming Wednesday, we need to reschedule and that, that will uh, take place. That's going to be Alexis. Uh, most of you know that, but that's going to be next week or the week after Alexis from Yellow. And uh, because some exciting news is coming on. So we need to reschedule a little bit. And, and Gordon said, you know, I've got somebody we can, who's available now on short notice. He's a really cool guy. And he's also from the Netherlands. I said, who is it? He said, it's Didi. I said, oh, fantastic. You know, because I, li I like the Didi story. I like him as a person, but also what he's doing with his family, you know, traveling the world, sharing the mm -hmm. message living the life uh, and, and contributing back. So that's, that's well, maybe a long answer to, to a quick no, uh, question, uh, Gordon. But, you know, I really appreciate it when, when people like, and we had so many good speakers, you know, David and Xavier and all the other guys. And now Didi also that also outside of the show, we have these guys connecting. So we have got yeah. the Telegram group. People are sharing opportunities with each other. People are sharing ideas, thoughts, whatever with each other and this is what i like because this was our goal when we started i think 13 14 15 weeks ago just just a couple of months ago when we said you know how can we pay back to the industry and how can we utilize our networks so people can network with each other you know we're just the middleman we we, we connect people and then they do business with each other or they, they build a new relationship which is the foundation of everything and this is what, it, what we've seen happening so i'm really it's a real high quality group of people you have put together. I have to yeah. say, like the vibes are very good. And like the, the, the level of conversation and intellect is just off the charts. So character, everything. It's really awesome. So thanks, guys. Yeah. I, 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 love, well, I, love, I love how everything morphs and evolves and becomes its own thing. That kind of, it, there's a blockchain -y aspect to this. Like we, 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 we keep on actually... forking. You know, it is, I, I keep on getting deja vu with the conversation I had with David this weekend. It's like, we don't, Sandra and I didn't necessarily know where, where, this, where this would go. And part of me wants there to be a plan. But, you know, at some point, I've, you know, as Dave and I were discussing, there's only so much Gordon, you know, as you can tell by the, you know, so I, sometimes I just need to like throw, keep on throwing the dice and let stuff happen. So it's, it's a good, it's a good deal. Didi, Didi I want to, I want to kind of like, you know, land this plane a little bit, uh, just because you've been very generous with your time. I think I want to mention you have a website for the Bitcoin yeah. family. You have a book, you have a YouTube channel. We're going to put this all in the show notes. Uh, but just give us a real kind of capsule version of when people want to get more of this vibe that you're exuding, how do they, how do they hone in on it? 
I think it mo the most easy part is just go to the YouTube channel, to the Bitcoin family. I I'm doing a daily YouTube show. I started with this, uh, I think, uh, three months ago when my, uh, I met a YouTuber that made insane amounts of money on YouTube. And I told my kids, okay, let's do this as a family. And they started laughing, man, you're 42 years old. You're not going to do a YouTube show and make money. But I said, if we make money with this YouTube show, you know, we can make money and give it to poor people and show this again so we can lead example for the rest of the world. So they were laughing. So I just started. And now the, the, the channel grew from 2K followers to 10K almost now and a lot of views and we started to make money. So now we are going to give this money away uh, to, to poor people, charities and everything. Because people still start to think to believe that I'm a billionaire or a millionaire. I don't even want to be this. We still don't own shit. We own a few Bitcoins and a few Litecoins and a few other cryptos. And everything we make, we give away because we believe that the, the power of happiness sits in giving and not in um, accumulating for yourself. So this is what I show my kids. And that is exactly what you will find on our YouTube channel. It's not about me, me, me. It's about the rest of the world. So if we make money uh, with YouTube and with books, with speaking, and we give it away. We, we left Koh Phangan, Thailand by giving 6,000 meals to the Thai community over there because you know they were bankrupt because of the COVID crisis. And we showed the kids how we did it, how we solved the problem. We bought, we bought a sewing machine so that people could, um, from the rice bags, could create new bags and wallets uh, so that they can make money for them. So uh, this is what we do with everything we make. So we don't accumulate well. And you got a beautiful family. I, th I think a wife and three daughters. Am I, am I seeing a, that correctly? A wife and three daughters. Sometimes uh, life is beautiful. Sometimes, sometimes life is a hell because, you know, you have three daughters. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's not always beautiful. It's, it's, it's always four against one. My wife, my wife is in the back, so. But you know, no, no. By, by the way, this entire show, she's had a sniper thing pointed at <laughs> yeah, her head. Yeah. I, I saw every mm -hmm. every once in a while I see the kind of the, the reticule pass across the screen when she when yeah. she misses your skull. But yeah, <laughs> no, it's a beautiful. I have a beautiful family. I'm, 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 they are healthy, and I'm, I'm so thankful that my wife was so open to changing life. You know, because I think that the people out there need to understand that we didn't do it because of becoming a millionaire. I did it because I needed to change life. I needed to escape the hamster wheel. I needed to make and create a new life for me and my family to show my family that a beautiful future without being egoistic, selfish, and materialistic is also possible. And by doing this, we came into this new roller coaster life called the Bitcoin family without even knowing that it would end up with that. And that is exactly what I try to, to tell people in our YouTube channels as well. It's yeah. And the key question, life, how, how do we get t-shirts? I have a shop. <laughs> the shop is on the bitcoinfamily.com. That is our website. And we have all these Bitcoin t-shirts. So like this one, run BTC. Uh, but, you know, it's all there. And uh, of the shop sales, I think 35% also goes to charity. Um, so that's also, I, I'm very transparent in that all. Uh, so yeah. Can I ask a quick lifestyle question here? Yeah. Uh, cause I'm doing, I'm doing a similar thing to you. Although my, my son actually just moved to Portugal <laughs> on his own. So he's doing his own little digital nomad thing. Um, but from a digital nomad perspective, um, there's a lot of places setting up where, where they're saying they're catering, they're, they're doing it in the Caribbean, which is where I am right now. Um, quite a bit Bermuda and Barbados are saying, Hey, come here, be your digital nomad here. Right. Which yeah. when you think about it is counterintuitive to being a digital nomad. Well, how are you solving the, the, uh, the sort of real world problem of if you're a true digital nomad, you don't have a residence anywhere, no. but to interact with the real world, it's very hard if you're quote unquote homeless, right? You don't have a jurisdiction that is yours. How are you handling that? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't see it difficult. You know, we, you, you can be homeless, but still the owner of a passport. And in this retarded system, we are living the passport is your access to everything else. Um, so, you, you know, you, you just play the loophole because if you are a homeless guy in the Netherlands, the only thing that you don't get is um, for every year you're homeless, you lose like 2% of your pension. But because I don't believe in pension, I don't see that as a lost uh, thing over there. Uh, the rest, you keep the same rights as a, as a Dutch citizen. So... You can have a bank account. No, no, I don't want a bank account. We don't have bank accounts. No. Oh, excellent. No, no, we don't have bank accounts. But, but even, even like with, how do you pass online KYC then if you don't have a residence? 
Like if yeah. you have to get a, one of those crypto cards, right? We, we have, a, we have, a, okay, I need to be honest. For me, it's a little bit difficult, a little bit more easy because you're, um, <clears throat> you're known in the scene. So much of these debit card com uh, companies then give you, um, give you a card in a different way. So like, <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, so we're going to leave that open. I just, I just got to give a shout but, out but to also Andy. But, but, one second, but, but yeah. also there, um, for these debit cards, for these KYCs, there are so many loopholes. It's just unbelievable that we didn't search. If you don't search for them, you won't find them. But it's, it's too easy. It's too easy. The, the, that by itself is a show, by the way. I because that, that yeah. was, I, I feel like we just hit a, a, a the golden mine or the mother load. Yeah, but KYC maybe lawyers shouldn't be on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andy, Andy, we're, we're literally I'm 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 prolonging the show because when you, someone like you comes on, I can't cut it short. So hey, Andy, man. meet Didi, Didi, meet Andy. Andy is a great, I don't even know how to describe you, but like Asia-based entrepreneur. Very hooked in with on the kind of on the government side has a lot of social media following and Andy take it from there. Well, hi man, hi uh, Bitcoin family guy. <laughs> good hi, you. Andy. Hey, good to see you. You 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 look good. You look good, man. I I, I was just telling Gordon uh, that I, I have to come on to say hi. Um, I, I was previously on. Um, I, I was um, just two minutes ago. I was on another live show talking to friends on uh, from Ghana about uh, cryptocurrency you know trying to correct some of the some of their thinking you know how, how cryptocurrency is going to be like and also in the in, in the morning i was uh, on a on a panel for asean uh, summit uh, where we talk about artificial intelligence uh deep tech and also uh uh a block blockchain man so today's a long day i just want to come by to say hi and uh and uh, probably ask you one final question you know um, on, uh, on, 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 on your journey, you know, I've, I've, I've read about what you have done, you know, how, how you are, you know, hundred percent into the, the, the space of uh, a Bitcoin. So my question is this, do you think uh, Bitcoin by the end of the year is going to hit 500,000? <laughs> first, first of all, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come online for a few minutes to say hi. Uh, did you say 500,000? 500,000 because are we the, are we the, talking the, the Gemini brothers are, are thinking that it, it, it will hit quite high, man. At the you end know, of this for, year? Yeah, I'm thinking at the end of this year, do you think it's going to be 500,000? It, it depends. If you're calculating in, in Indonesia, rupiah or Turkish lira, yeah, I think. But <laughs> if, you're telling, if you're talking uh, US dollars, I don't think we will reach 500,000 end of this year, but I do think it could be a target in the, in the bull run. Um, but let's see what, how, how the world evolves. You know, I think if, 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 if the governments keep printing money <laughs> and keep uh -huh. making it more easy for us all to buy Bitcoin, I can see a lot of uh, beautiful new heights coming into this uh, new uh, bull run. I think it's going to be an extended bull run if they keep printing money and people get smaller and invest more and more. You know, you can see all these huge company. I just read today again, um, this uh, a micro micro technic company. Yep. They add, they added again like like sixteen thousand Bitcoin to their reserve assets. So they I think that as that get as as these huge company and funds start to exchange their reserve dollar assets for Bitcoins more and more, I think the the sky is the limit, and we will see a, a very beautiful trip to the moon. Yeah. I, I, on that note, any and yeah, I'm sorry. We're we're, we're literally. I'm honored that you got, came on here, but we're literally at the two-hour mark. So everyone, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Senator, you want to wrap up the wrap-up? Yeah, I think this is easy because I'm so, so happy. You know, every week we say we are grateful for everybody joining. And now Didi is part of our Crypto Wednesday community. I'm really excited that people, we don't have to chase people to, to come to the show. We, we, friends like Andy, you know, they, they want to join um, David, Marco, who's here every week. Thank you for that. Xavier and all the other guys who are here. Really appreciate it. Shout next out week. Xavier. Woo. Yeah, cool, yeah. cool. So next week, same time, same place. We always use the same link. So for everybody that has been on the live show, thanks for joining. If you're watching the recording, 
great. Please share it with as much people as you as you like. We will post all the channels also from Didi and the Bitcoin family underneath our uh, channel so we can all help each other. This is the goal of what, what we're doing. We're all helping each other. We're sharing, you know, we're building the community and so forth. So I think we wrap it up. Thanks everybody and thanks especially to Didi and all the other alumni speakers for joining today's call and we look forward again to see you next week all and have a good week and stay health and uh, uh, safe guys so enjoy thank it you guys. thank Bye you everyone. thank you so much amazing bye thank you all